This video is for The Living Earth, Unit 1.4, Biomes. Today's essential question, what are the characteristics of Earth's aquatic biomes? Our first main idea, freshwater biomes. Most bodies of freshwater are small when compared to seas and oceans and are, therefore, more readily influenced by changes in temperature and may freeze during the winter. Freshwater biomes fall into two broad categories, moving water and standing water. Moving water includes rivers and streams, where standing water includes ponds, lakes, temporary pools, freshwater swamps, and freshwater wetlands. Glaciers are important bodies of frozen freshwater that move very slowly and may be considered freshwater biomes. However, very few organisms are found in a glacier biome. River systems start at springs and small streams and increase in size as they gather water. They can be divided into zones based on a position between the source and the sea. And here we divide them into three zones. Source zone, transition zone, and floodplain zone. Although no, no two rivers are exactly alike, each of these zones has characteristic abiotic and biotic features. Source zones are the headwaters of a river, and these streams are fed from springs and mountain lakes. These streams typically have a rocky substrate, are clear and cold, and flow rapidly. And as a result, they are commonly rich in oxygen, but low in nutrients. The organisms that live in these conditions are adapted to hold their position in strong current or hide under rocks. The transition zone of a river occurs at lower elevations where the channel is wider, the speed of the flow is moderate, and the water is warmer. The river contains more suspended matter and dissolved nutrients and sediments settle on the riverbed. In the floodplain zone, the tributaries join to produce a big river, and the water is typically muddy and contains even more nutrients. The channel is wide, and the current is slow, with many aquatic plants growing near the banks. These rivers are often green with phytoplankton and floating plants, such as lilies. The banks of these rivers often have many emergent plants, and a wide variety of fish are found in these rivers depending on the local conditions. Lakes and ponds. Lakes and ponds are standing bodies of water surrounded by land, and the communities found in lakes depend on their size and depth. Some very large lakes, such as the Great Lakes of North America, have many of the same characteristics as oceans. Depending on the depth, lakes are considered to have zones which result from differences in light, temperature, oxygen, and nutrient availability. The well-lit area close to shore, where rooted and floating plants grow, is called the littoral zone. Farther away from the shore is the limnetic zone, where the upper layers of water are illuminated by the sun and generally are rich in oxygen. Below this zone is dark water, where photosynthesis cannot take place, and oxygen concentration and temperature are lower. Organisms, including certain fish, have adapted to these conditions. The lake floor, or benthic zone, consists of sediment occupied by a wide range of invertebrates and bottom-feeding fish. Benthic zone organisms rely on detritus from above for their nutrition. Levels of dissolved oxygen determine the types of organisms that can live in a lake, being that oxygen can enter the lake either directly from the air or through the photosynthetic activity of plants, algae, and phytoplankton. Wave action mixes lake water with the air and increases the levels of dissolved oxygen, while decomposition of organic matter by fungi and bacteria removes oxygen through the process of respiration. The removal of oxygen from the water is called biological oxygen demand, or BOD. 
Due to decomposition, the amount of organic matter and other nutrients in a lake plays a role in determining the organisms that can live in it. And consequently, lakes are often classified by the amount of organic matter that they contain. Lakes that are low in nutrients are called oligotrophic and support low densities of organisms. Oligotrophic lakes are typically cold and deep, and their waters are very clear. Lakes with more nutrients support more organisms and are called eutrophic. Eutrophic lakes have elevated levels of nutrients, high plant growth, and may contain green-colored water as a result of the presence of phytoplankton. Mesotrophic lakes lie between the two extremes. Freshwater wetlands are areas of shallow water that support the growth of aquatic plants. Marshes are covered with water year-round and are dominated by emergent plants, such as reeds and sedges. Swamps are dominated by bushes and trees, while bogs are typically found in mountain and tundra, uh, tundra areas and are dominated by spongy moss. Most bogs have a low pH and are low in available nutrients. Fens are wetlands dominated by grasses and sedges that are typically fed by mineral-rich surface water or groundwater. Wetlands provide humans with a wide variety of surfaces, including flood protection, water storage, and pollutant filtration. Many wetlands have been destroyed by draining for agriculture and development. Our next main idea, marine biomes. Marine biomes have salinities above 1%, and most seawater is around 3% salt. Being that marine biomes cover such a large part of Earth's surface, they have a major impact on climate. Through photosynthesis, the phytoplankton in the ocean provide more than half the world's oxygen and absorb large amounts of carbon dioxide. Marine biomes reside in various locations, including those on the shore, the, uh, the shallow seas offshore over the continental shelf, and then the open ocean. Where the ocean meets the land is the shore or intertidal zone. This area can be a harsh place for organisms to live. Twice a day along most shorelines, tides submerge and then expose most of the substrate. The organisms that live on the shore are exposed to major changes in salinity of freshwater, or sorry, saltwater, as well as the freshwater from rain. When it is not underwater, the temperature of the shore may rise and organisms are exposed to the sun. In cold climates, organisms may be exposed to temperatures much lower than those of the seawater. Wave action regularly batters the shore, damaging or washing away shore organisms. Organisms on the shore distribute themselves according to their tolerance uh, to these abiotic factors. This distribution creates a vertical zonation of organisms on the shore. Organisms that are submerged only at high tides, such as barnacles, lichens, and limpets, have adaptations that prevent overheating and drying. The middle zones have organisms such as mollusks and crabs that can survive along with small fish in rock pools. The area exposed only by the lowest tide has the most diverse shore community, with lots of seaweed and a wide array of invertebrates. Other shores are sandy or muddy. Most of the organisms on these shores bury themselves in the substrate. In the sand or mud are small crustaceans and worms that feed on algae, archaea, bacteria, and other organic matter. Birds, uh, such as plovers, are major predators. Where the tide goes out a long distance, flat intertidal marshes develop. These marshes support many different salt-tolerant grasses and reeds. Mangrove swamps, like the one you see on the screen here, are a group of trees, uh, sorry, are a type of marine shore found in subtropical and tropical areas. Mangroves are a group of, of tree species that are adapted to grow in salt water. 
They form forests in shallow tidal areas. They are among the most productive ecosystems on Earth because they provide homes for a wide variety of invertebrates and act as nurseries for many fish species. At this point, you should be able to generate a full and appropriate response to today's essential question. What are the characteristics of Earth's aquatic biomes? <laughs>